So the chart tells you, I'm Glenn Henry. I come from a little company called Centaur Technology, which I'll tell you about. Um, the word technology is overused, so I thought I'd describe what we have. We have a chip, it runs, it's been demonstrated at a trade show, but it's not a product. And what I'm talking about today is hardware, at least 90% hardware. <laughs> the, the deep learning or AI world is dominated by inventions in software, but they still have to run on something. So that's what, therefore, there's our part uh, at a trade show. And if you can see the picture, it's running a variety of standard object detection kinds of uh, or better applications. Uh, since our technology is, this will be our 25th anniversary, is started by myself and three other people who left Dell with the idea to build a low-cost x86 processor, which we have done for 25 years. No one has heard of us, but uh, we, the, I have a list here of people you've heard of, HP, Dell, IBM, etc., which have actually used our parts over those 25 years. We're only about 100 people, but we contain everything necessary to build a custom SOC, which I'll show you, uh, not just the logic and architecture, but the circuit design, DV, manufacturing, engineering, and so forth. So that's Centaur. This is what, I'm gonna tell you what we uh, built, that's the what, but I wanna start by talking about the uh, why we built it. Whatever, I, I go to a lot of presentations and whatever is presented is obsolete usually in two to three years. But why they chose what they chose is I think important in learning how to build the next thing. So I'll talk a little bit about the philosophy or objectives and then I'll tell you what it is and show you some uh, benchmark results and what have you. History is, uh, we started a new processor three years ago. It was almost a from scratch. Uh, we call it uh, CHA. And I decided that that processor should have a coprocessor to accelerate um, deep learning inference. Uh, the reasons are obvious. I have actually used this chart before and I had a whole list of reasons and I realized it's obvious that one should do it, so I took the reasons out. Our challenges are there was nothing to copy, we had to invent something, and we didn't have any people to work on it. So uh, we're a small company, we make do. I did the uh, hardware architecture and the RTO myself, got a build guy, so two of us did the hardware. We did hire someone who knew something, uh, Parviz, and we rounded up a bunch of our really smart um, we have a very good relationship with UT, University of Texas, and we pretty much are able to hire their best and brightest. We had a bunch of you know, new hires and uh, they put together our software team. And I think when you see what we've done, it's pretty impressive and that team was uh, quite good. And we decided to uh, design the architecture from scratch. And there's three key words there that sort of dominated our um, our thinking. One was flexible because this uh, field is moving rapidly. There's a paper every day and every week there's a paper that's really good. And uh, even in the three years since we started, things have changed a lot. So we wanted something that had uh, legs for the future in it, something we could modify easily. The other couple things that were important to us was efficiency. This was a coprocessor being attached to something, and at the start we had no idea how much space we would have. This was not the, the main fo focus of this chip. In fact, this was often called Glenn's Folly in the early days because you know, it was just something that a small team was doing on the side. So we had to be able to fit in lots of different holes, and we obviously had to be very efficient. We're not gonna have a wafer scale chip like some people in the industry have, or, monster chips. And uh, we have to deal with the coprocessor. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about why coprocessing is wonderful and some of the challenges that go with it. By the way, if you people that are here have questions, just call them out. Uh, not this is a, all right. So why a coprocessor? 
Uh, it's almost free. First of all, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you, is already on the chip that you don't have to pay for, including the cost of the chip itself. In addition, uh, there's usually, and I think when you see the die plot of our chip, there's, you can see there's usually some spare space on these chips because uh, of pins and other uh, considerations. So the, the space you take in a coprocessor is not all costly, but even so, at the worst case, you're paying for just square millimeters of a much larger die. There are no extra pins, there's no extra package. Uh, it's cheap. And in our case, and we took advantage of this intentionally, is the fact that we have, it's a coprocessor, and I'll show how it's attached to, uh, it turns out to be eight reasonably high performance x86 cores. And so you can use those cores to do things you don't want to do in the specialized hardware. You can use it to prototype new functions, etc. So you get an, an advantage that way. And from a customer viewpoint, I put the sales job down the bottom. It's always there. You don't have to buy new chips. You don't have to add a PCI device. You don't have to do anything. It's there. And as you'll see, it has good performance. And to us, it has negligible delta cost. Uh, why doesn't everyone do it? Well, all those things you got for free, you have to live with them. Uh, like the power distribution, the clock distribution, the speeds, things like that. Um, and it turns out there's not a good coprocessor architecture in the x86 world. Uh, that is how you should talk to it, how it talks to other things. And so we had to invent that. And we're inherently limited in performance. Now, it turns out that's not a big problem. We think our performance is good enough. But there are devices you can buy out there for $1,000 or more that have super fast memories, GDD, GDDR memories. And there's a lot of people in the industry, probably 100 startups, trying to build a chip. And the chips are huge. How many of those become chips this remains to be seen. We don't have that luxury. And therefore, efficiency, getting the maximum performance per you know, square millimeter, uh, was very important to us. The objectives that we had at the start, and there still are objectives for us all. The part I haven't showed you yet is designed for what's generally called an edge server. Uh, the classic example of that, and I use as an example of our environment, we have 100 cameras scattered around. And no one's watching them, obviously. We don't. <laughs> and it's too expensive to send the bandwidth up to the cloud. And there's, so we just record it, and no one ever sees it. But with an edge server, those 100 cameras could be managed by a one box running our chip. And you could be running object detection, face detection, whatever you want, looking for someone stealing candy or whatever you want to do. Now, we don't have a real application there, but there are lots of them. So during this development, we actually worked with a, uh, two companies, one of which is a standard security company, has hundreds of thousands of cameras around the world, but nothing happens. The data is just recorded and disappeared, and they are desperate for applications that they can do, and it's all edge servers. They're not sending all that data to the, to the cloud. Um, our, I don't know how much you know about this area, but uh, we decided that we were going to focus on applications that did not need retraining. And that leaves out a lot of great ideas that are coming out in papers, as I said, every day. Uh, because of those things require retraining, and at various points we looked at some. But the practice is, other than a few big giants, normal customers don't have the ability to retrain their applications or don't have the money to retrain them or the technical skills. Uh, Google does, you know, Amazon does, etc. But the kind of people that uh, might buy our chip usually don't. So we decided to not count on retraining. What we were trying to do is have the best performance per dollar of, of any real system. I make a comment on here about uh, something that gets a certain level of ResNet. I mean, there are processors you can buy for 50 cents out there, right? Maybe they have really good performance for cost. We have no idea. We're talking about real processors. 
our real systems, and our goal was to have the best performance per dollar period. Now, what we're not going to have is the best performance per watt, and that is an important metric in this industry. It affects some, but it doesn't really matter that much to an edge server. Our delta power just fits within the envelope, and it's not going to be low because there's a pro the rest of the processor sitting there, plus we optimized for performance, not for power. And that does make a difference in uh, your design. Uh, and we're not going to have the best raw performance. As I mentioned, there are people out there that are building massive chips that will cost literally thousands of dollars a chip. And they're, uh, they're certainly, uh, with NVIDIA, you can spend thousands and thousands of dollars on their designs, and they have very good performance. That was not what we were aiming at. Uh, and what's that? Where's, natural oh, natural language, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. I mentioned that because image is the obvious application here. In fact, it's the application I just mentioned with my 100 cameras. But we're interested in the future, and we think the, well, the future is NLP. And it turns out NLP is much, 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 much harder than image. And so, uh, in fact, I'll show you later, we have running and submitted to a benchmark. We were the only chip company that submitted this benchmark of a Google neural machine translation application that does translation, just as an example. Um, and uh, one other thing here, which is latency. We think in an edge server, latency is important, um, not just frames per second. The, in the, the image world, you can get good scores by massive batching which is a lot of the GPUs do. And naturally, we do batching too, but uh, we thought it was very important what the latency per image is, and so we did some special things for that. Uh, since performance was so important to us, we focused a lot on what we call a Mac efficiency. So it's obvious, but I want to talk a little bit about it and what its implications are. All we're talking about is, you know, if you run for a second and you're running at umpteen teramax and you have umpteen teramax of performance available to you, but the application doesn't use those max all the time. In fact, I comment up here uh, that the efficiency is not nearly as good as you think. Um, yeah. When you say latency, that's for what kind of operation? Uh, yeah. Uh, object detection, classif image classification, object detection. Um, so one of the first things we did was go out and buy equipment, obviously, and study uh, what was happening. We concluded that the leverage, I say on the chart here, a Mac is a Mac. You're not going to build a better Mac. They all run in one clock, at least for integer, and you just have as many of them as you have, thousands, typically. Uh, the the uh, trick, we think, is data. There's a lot of data manipulation here. Unpacking, unpacking, reshaping three-dimensional arrays to the shape of your neurons, etc. And so from the start, and you'll see it later when I talk about what we actually did, we decided to put spend a, some of our hardware on doing those operations. <coughs> In fact, I mentioned it here, we designed our convolutional algorithms and our, hard, our data movement hardware together. And they're sort of funny, but they work really well. And we get high efficiency. I'm not going to quote efficiency numbers, but we get like 25% more than a lot of people in this industry in terms of uh, the efficiency. <coughs> we also... Someone mentioned Amdahl Klar, we also uh, remember it too. And we have done hardware for all the things that don't happen very often, but when they happen in a CPU, they're quite slow. And so we added hardware to speed those up. These are the things we had to decide on uh, how, how the coprocessor is going to talk to software, how it's going to talk to the application, 
what, how much we're going to spend on things we know about, which is image, and how much we're going to spend on other things. Uh, memory is a big deal. Well, that'll be obvious. I mentioned the data function. That was invention schedule. We don't see anyone else that's doing the kind of things that we thought needed to be do, uh, done. I will highlight one thing, which is a coprocessor issue. As I said, this started being just a corner of another chip, and no one knew how big the corner was, and so scalability was really important to us. We had to fit, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but I'll, it says on a future chart that we had three different sizes during our design process, where we had design for this and had to redo it. So um, that was a key thing we had to decide how to do, and of course, the first question that people usually ask me is, what did you do, a systolic array, a distributed set of cores, blah, 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 and I'll mention that. We did something different than most, but it's the most obvious thing to do. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about what we did. There is the CHA chip. It's got eight cores, 16 meg of memory. Now, the cores are pretty modern. They're four issue cores. They have 10 functional units that the instructions are issued to. Uh, you know, pretty close to uh, a reasonably modern uh, Intel part. Uh, we compare sort of with one particular part, as codename Haswell, but in addition to what that part has, we also added AVX512, which is Intel's 64-byte wide SIMD architecture. Uh, we have four memory controllers, which is medium. Uh, lots of PCI lanes, because in this edge server world, there's lots of devices you want to talk. 44 is a lot, and actually has a pretty hefty cost, as you'll see uh, when we get to some charts. This is, it runs at 2.5 gigahertz. Now, that may sound slow when you can buy an Intel part for 4 gigahertz, but that Intel part doesn't run at 4 gigahertz all the time. But real, realistically, we're using, I hate to say it on television, but old and slow technology. <laughs> this is in six, <laughs> 16 nanometer FFC, which is not the fast 16 nanometer stuff from TSMC. And uh, today you can read about people that are in 7 nanometer and going to 5 nanometer as are we, but this part is in a relatively slow technology because that's what we had. So two and a half gigahertz is uh, pretty good in my opinion. Also, this does support dual die or dual socket, which is a big deal in the server industry. You know, two parts, almost all the server boards have uh, two parts. So it's pretty obvious where we're going to attach our coprocessor is going to attach to the rings. The rings are the glue that ties everything together. There's 64, there's two of them that go in opposite directions. 64 bytes wide, running at clock speed. And it's just as you suspect, you put a token on the ring and say, I'd like to read, I'd like the data at this address. And after a while, the data at that address comes back. Everyone on the ring sees that request and the right guy responds to it. So it's a perfect internal architecture for a coprocessor. There is our die and you can actually see the eight cores, the O3 and the IO, but I have an overlay on it to make it more clear. So, at the top of the 44 lanes of PCIe, and you can see across the top the drivers. PCIe has pretty fast drivers, they're pretty big, and so a lot of them up there. And at the bottom is the, you can see the four uh, DRAM controllers. They also have a lot of pins. You can see the drivers creeping along the bottom. The, there's four cores on either side, and the cores have attached to them a lump of the L3, so the L3 is in the middle there, and over on the left is what became of our coprocessor. I'm going to mention later 
about the compute versus RAM size, and the truth is we ended up with more size than we thought, so we fill it with RAM, but I'll talk about that. But you can see the size of the compute unit and how we, uh, and if we hadn't been there, I'm not saying all that space is for free, but you can see it's a major reshaping to get all those pins into the part and consume that space. Okay, I'm gonna talk about connectivity because that's very important. So the coprocessor appears to be a PCI device, follows all the rules of PCI device, does PCI configuration, it's got a memory mapped address space of 32 megs, so like any other PCI device at boot time, it just grabs that much address space and uh, it's there. The, uh, I guess that's about all that chart says. There's two ways to talk to, that people talk to it. The core can directly read and write through that address space to memory. You notice memory appears down below. So there's memory in, the, uh, in our neural engine and there's compute. The arrows indicate that uh, our memory, as I'll come to later, actually has two read ports and one write port. So that's in the middle there. But the x86 can send data to memory, read data out of the RAMs, can also read data, you know, status registers, can write control registers, all the things you'd, you'd suspect. And the uh, N-Core can also interrupt back to x86 so it can demand action, if you will. <laughs> um, then we have two DMA engines a read and a write, and those DMA engines can, again, talk to things on the ring. There's some special cases I'll mention in a second. Um, and they do it, as it's, it's driven by the program itself. The program will say, please start a read to this address of this many megabytes and use tag 13, you know? And later it'll wait on tag 13. And it, uh, the DMA is running all the time. It's got a lot of optimizations uh, in there. And there are mapping registers in the PCI config space that help map it into the right, right place. Um, so, uh, and you can see that DMA is writing to RAM, reading things out of RAM. The program, the compute part of it's controlling it, etc. And all these things are running at the same time. The program, both buses, and this was actually the hardest part of the design to do. I'm speaking now as a hardware designer of this. It wasn't designing the compute engine. It was making all this stuff work. Uh, obviously, there's contention for the RAM. We have more buses than our ports on the RAM, so obviously stalls and things had to happen. Most of the time, everything is running. The device driver is sending data in, the DMA is reading data in, the compute engine is reading and writing the, the, uh, the RAMs. Um, it shows up there that we don't talk to I.O. There's nothing, we could, the ring is capable, but we can write to uh, DRAM, we can read from DRAM, and we can read from the L3 caches, so again, the device driver is pre-fetching into the caches, et cetera, um, as you suspect. So that's our connectivity. It's, uh, we think, fairly robust, and obviously there's a device driver that goes with it, I'll show that later, that helps manage all that. So I mentioned that we had to have something that was scalable and flexible. And we jump immediately to the third bullet, and what we did was use the SIMD architecture. I'm going to show, show it. It's extremely efficient in size. Uh, and it's very scalable. You just do vertical slices of it. You know, I'm jumping ahead, but we have 4,000 neurons, so it's 4,000 bytes wide, 32,000 bit wide SIMD. So you can slice it at various points, and we've done that, and it's just a slice, and you can then build with that. Uh, it's got good latency, all 
4,000 all 4,000 accumulators are visible at the same time, and it fits into our processor mentality. Now, we also uh, decided to run as fast as we could, at least up to the speed of the rest of the chip, uh, because that we were limited in area and speed equals performance. So the, this is a simple chart that says, during our, what we have is the slices and a central spine connecting them. You'll see a real picture in a second. And what happened is we had more vertical area, we added more RAM. The RAM went vertically. And as you notice, we ended up with a lot of RAM on the part. As we got more horizontal area, I assume you know that on a chip, not everything's equal. So the arrays only go one way. They can't be rotated, et cetera. Um, uh, as we got more horizontal space, we added more slices. And uh, the spine is just wires and buffers connecting things, except the thing that you, the, it's 70, so there's only one instruction controlling all of them, so the instruction processor is down in the spine and it's fanning out. So what did we end up with? Oh, by the way, there's where I mentioned that we had three different sizes during development, where we had to change the, the number of neurons we had and the slice architecture. What we ended up with was a thing, and it's going to look just like this in a second, which is 16 slices. They're 256 bytes. Um, each. So it's 4,000 bytes, AVX32768 to compare with Intel's AVX512. Uh, runs at 2.5 gigahertz, which has 20 teraops a second. But again, I point out it's that sort of a specsmanship number. What's more important is the benchmark scores because the efficiency varies so much on different benchmarks and different architectures. It, we ended up with 16 meg of RAM, which is a lot, but realistically, there's only one or two simple applications that will fit in that RAM. Most of the applications have more RAM than that, and that's why we spend our time on the uh, connectivity and the DMA. We're going to see that picture later. I'll explain what's in it. Basically, the compute part, the slices, are there in the middle. You can see the central spine there, and the RAM is a, sticks above and below. OK, so we've reached the point where I'm going to talk about what's in there the architecture. That's, we have four basic blocks that are pipelined. There's one instruction processor that uh, generates the controls for the pipeline, and uh, the whole thing is 4,000 bytes wide. There are some interconnections across that, which I'll mention uh, because they're special. The, now, you notice how small the instruction memory is. An instruction here, I'll talk more about it later, is actually 128 bits. So it's got a lot of functionality in it because it controls the entire pipeline and every instruction branches in one of these architectures. So one of the things we had to do is make sure branches took zero clocks, so just as uh, required. So this thing is, uh, the, uh, the programs are not very big in the sense of this is a convolution and it runs for so long you don't even notice loading in the memory, the instructions for the next convolution. Um, everything works in one clock. Um, those, the, the NPU, NDU, and RAMs I'm going to talk about are loops. That is, the output has to be available for the input of the next clock. And so they're one clock by definition. Uh, I mentioned the instructions, control DMA. Now, there is one exception to the one clock. I'll mention it on the out. The out unit does activations and other things that happen only once in a while. Back to my Amdahl's law, we try to make them fast, but they don't happen but once every few million uh, clocks or so. 
And so that's actually uh, internally sub-multiplexed. But the pipeline above that can continue to run at full speed. This chart just, someone once in a presentation uh, accused me of something because I said everything runs in one clock. Well, all the functional units really are one clock, but in between the functional units, <laughs> you have to, you know, you have this giant span of, of stuff you have to move around, uh, or extra clocks, but it doesn't matter until you get something that is written up the pipeline, and that happens very, very rarely. There are no branches here, so you don't have to worry about cost of a branch misprediction. Uh, and once every convolution, using image at the end of every convolution, which is typically millions of calculations, you do an output, and so you have to wait, wait for that. But the, the code almost never waits because you can start the next convolution overlap with where you are. There's a variety of memory synchronization things to allow you to do that. Okay. The RAMs, there's two two of them so to provide two read ports. Each read port can read every clock. Uh, there's a, writes are rarer, so there's only one write port into them. Uh, the buses are reading and writing, but those are all buffered up until we get an entire row. A row to us is 4,000 bytes. That's the width of this thing. So everything is incoming data from the buses is only 64 bytes, so you buffered up till you have an entire row that's 64 and then you dump it in in one clock. So there's really little interference here from the, uh, from the buses. And we actually have implemented ECC on the memory uh, because it's uh, big enough that we thought that should do that. One of the key things, and I'm not really talking about the instruction set here much, is very rich addressing functions are needed. If you look inside of this thing when it's running, it's got you know five DMAs running, it's got you know five different parts of the convolution overlap, so we have a lot of addressing, a lot of index registers, a lot of powerful addressing mechanisms um, in the instruction set. This is always a question comes up, <clears throat> should be obvious, but this memory is not coherent. It belongs to NCore. It's up to the NCore application and device driver <coughs> to manage it. At, why is that? Well, first of all, it would be terribly costly to make it coherent, costly in size and performance. And second of all, quite honestly, when we started, it seemed obvious it should be after we worked out a lot of stuff. It was obvious that it didn't need to be in. It's, it's been not an issue at all. Uh, we also point out, interestingly enough, if you, the RAM is available sort of all the time, so it can be used as a scratch pad for applications and things like that. Okay, the neural data unit is, we think, and I've got a second chart on it, the key to our efficiency. It has lots, it has a lot of inputs. It only has four output registers, so it's either the world's smallest register file or the world's largest, because it's four, which is the smallest, but it's four by 4,000 or 16,000 bytes of register file. Uh, and what it, go, and it does a whole bunch of stuff in parallel. It does, I'm gonna talk more about this, but it does rotates, it does compression after pooling, you know, shoving bytes back together. It, uh, does broadcast, which is key to our convolution algorithm, basically taking one byte out of an inc incoming block and replicating it. Our convolutions work that way. And then on the next clock, it'll take a second byte and replicate it, etc. cetera. Um, there's a lot of functionality there. It can do merging of two things using a mask, which was a calculated mask. At, Use it. These are functions that we didn't invent on sort of didn't invent on day one. These are functions that became clearer when we started looking at the application code, uh, and everything works in on one clock. This is uh, 
from a hardware viewpoint, one of the great miracles of life. <laughs> uh, I mentioned uh, these things. Every clock, things are being done here. The ones that are being done most often, almost every clock, are broadcast at a rotate. The rotate's part of the, you know, reshaping the data. Uh, merge, compress, some other things there. Uh, I mentioned that the convolution algorithm is designed around this BCAS function, which is very easy to do, but very powerful, and vice versa. And we also use the XA6 cores to prepare data. Our, the internal formats of the weights and things are in the form. Since weights don't matter, we put them in the format, we reshape them when the application is loaded in the format we needed, and let the x86 cores do some work there. The uh, neural processing unit, MPU, does what you'd expect. <laughs> it does max and a number of other things. We support three data size as eight bits, which is really a nine bit calculation, a 16 bit integer, and the new floating point 16-bit floating point called bfloat16. Uh, an integer MAC takes, an 8-bit integer MAC takes one clock. Uh, floating point MAC takes uh, three clocks, which I think is pretty typical. We have predication, which we use quite a bit in the thing. Uh, a variety of things, min and max for pooling and things like that. The accumulator is 32 bits and it's in either 32-bit integer or 32-bit single precision floating point if you're doing floating point. And when you're an integer, it's saturating. It doesn't wrap around. Uh, we did a lot of early on, we did a lot of calculations proving to ourselves that the accumulators didn't need to be 32 bits, but we did it anyway. And then when we got around to doing floating point, of course, that was convenient. Uh, in addition to the inputs that come from the four output registers of the move unit, the data is also can be moved from one, the input from one neuron is registered and moved to the next neuron. That's also part of our convolution scheme. Fairly typical. Uh, think of the classical fully connected neural network. You just ripple the data down through all the neurons, each one getting a different weight. Uh, we happen to do our 8-bit uh, quantization on the way in, but can be done differently. <clears throat> the output unit is one of the most ugly or complicated <laughs> because it does what? <laughs> yes. Okay. So first of all, we have to do quantization, and I spent an inordinate amount of time on uh, quantization, reading other. Google code and things like that, uh, trying to get it down. Uh, right, but it does quantization, uh, most coming from either you know, Google or uh, PyTorch. It does a number of the popular activations, ReLU, and a number of variations on ReLU you can do, you know, a ReLU that doesn't always clip to zero kind of thing. It does hyperbolic tangent and sigmoid, which are somewhat falling out of favor, but they're still there, and we do them. It's got a couple output registers. Again, when I say registers, I mean 4,000 bytes here, right? And the, everything's SIMD. Uh, it can also just store the accumulators back in the memory in a variety of different things. And as I said, things take one o'clock or three clocks, depending on how complicated they are but we typically will multiplex it eight to one. So you have to, but it's pipeline, so it's still quite fast. Um, this is a catch-all. I'm not admitting to a follow-on, but if there was a follow-on, it would have even more stuff, right? Like a divide for soft max and things like that, if that means anything to people. Uh, Outsert error. But when they happen, the pipeline above continues to run, and the software takes advantage of that to overlap them. So all those 
annoying little things sort of disappear from a performance viewpoint. Uh, implementation challenges. It sounds easy to say 32,000 bit wide data path. The hardness of it is not on any piece. It's on getting the whole thing connected together. You remember, you've got input data coming in that's got to get distributed to the right piece of RAM. You've got instructions coming in which have to go to all slices, et cetera. So a substantial amount of the RTL is just managing, uh, hooking everything together. The two and a half gigahertz is a challenge. I'd point out that no other neural thing that we know of runs anywhere near that fast. Typical NVIDIA things are less than two gigahertz, and a lot of the new things are running slower than that. Now, in fairness, they're probably making them power versus megahertz trade-offs. Um, as an example, I'll pick the sequencer. Remember I said uh, branches have to be dead in zero clocks. So first you've got to fetch the data. So you have a register for the address. Data just pours out of the RAM. And then you've got to decode it and figure out, is it branching and what branch is it? We have call returns. We have regular branches. We have looping. We have stalls. You know, basically there's a six to one mux, I think, on the branch address and to get the branch address and send it back around for the next fetch. And that left 150 picoseconds to do decode and branch selection, which is not much in this technology. Um, that's just an example. Uh, the NDU, I'll point out in a picture coming up, is a lot of wiring. You know, all those functions I mentioned, compress, bcast, rotate, are just lots of wire, lots of muxing. Uh, and of course, wires are slow in, tech, in the modern technology. The RAMs were challenged by themselves without getting into detail. There's four different people that can write to them, four different people that can read to them, getting all that data distributed, staged, because the RAM still have to work in one clock. So if you write to the RAM, the data is available the next clock. Uh, this was a build a masterpiece. We happen to have a very, very good build person, and he and I work well together. The RTL and the build were done, you know, hand in glove every single day kind of thing. Uh, it's just that type of thing uh, that you get to when you're trying to make something 4,000 bytes wide and small. There it is. The, uh, the I.O. is all coming in on the right. There's about a little over 2,000 pins of I.O. And it is processed down the middle till you see the sequencer, which I put a box around. That's the entire instruction process, including the instruction RAMs. Uh, they're in there. You can see the RAMs are in the top and the bottom. To the right of the sequencer, there's a couple of arrays. You can see they're black little things there. Those are FIFOs for the memory data uh, because the memory data can interfere. It needs to write to the RAM, but the instruction is reading from that RAM, and so you have to stall something. Um, and that spine there is just filled with wires and registers and buffers moving data around. To the left of the sequencer is a uh, thousand deep log array, which again, if we were doing something else, would make a lot bigger. I didn't talk about it here, but one of the challenges of a design like this is debug, <laughs> or, or uh, knowing what's going on, right? And so we put, I put in every debug function that I'm used to from a processor, but one of the most powerful ones that we use heavily is a clock-by-clock -clock log, it's a, uh, which is that thing on the left. As it turned out, again, we had more room than at the end than we thought. The uh, 16 slices can be seen, and one with a trained eye can notice the slices at the ends are different than the slices in the middle. I mentioned rotate, so I'll probably lose this. These two things are moving data both directions, right? Well, when you get to here, the data has to be moved up, and you can see some of the wiring creeping up. 
that this is only three levels of metal, any more than that, and it becomes opaque. The, uh, the bright green there is the, is the data units that are almost all wire. I mean, there's obviously some registers there, but it's just literally tens of thousands of, uh, of weird-shaped mucks. Think of compress, right? Take something, and we do several different compressors, you know, two to one, three to one, et cetera. Uh, the seas of muxes, and that's what's going on in the green there. Um, I guess, and uh, the non-green is <laughs> compute, right? Now, as I set up above, that's about 11 square millimeters and 16 nanometers, and five nanometers, which uh, the world's enamored of, that would be about a third that size. You know, the size reduction is more than 2x closer. 3x, it's about 20 million and gates. Okay, code. I say this is all hardware. I'll be a little bit of code here. That's um, a real hunk of code up there. Sort of looks like a high level language. It's in an internal thing we call smart assembler. But that's what a one step of a convolution looks like. And it says down below what it is. It's going to get some weight, weight data. It's going to do a BCAST to create the 64, replicate a byte 64 times. Then it's going to use that data with the MAC using as the data the input to the next lower number. While it's doing that, it's going to rotate a 4,000 byte row because it's not needed here, but it's getting ready for the next use. And this instruction is going to execute four times. It's got a loop, so we have standard looping stuff. And some variation of that is the heart of convolutions that have been polished and, and uh, studied, and the hardware is very efficient um, for those. I mentioned a lie there. We don't read the data every time. The instruction says read the data, but since we know we have already read the data and it's scrolled away in yet another place and just automatically uh, appears. What about, what do our real instructions look like? There are 128 bits and I listed there for, you know, the uh, for the type of instruction that did that convolution step a second ago, roughly how many bits are used. And the truth is that the average instruction might use 64 to 80 bits, but there are some that need almost all, all of them. Um, the instruction set is hardware dependent. It's very low level. Uh, we follow the theory that the, this is perhaps controversial, but that the goal of software is to simplify hardware. <laughs> oh, hardware guy, what can I say? <laughs> but fortunately, this, the software that does this is not, as I said, is not going to be made public. And uh, no one needs to worry about it because we actually have tools and we have a software stack. So finally, we get to my software chart. We started off, when we started off, PyTorch wasn't that exciting. It wasn't that big a deal as it is now. Uh, TensorFlow was, uh, we thought, the best approach. So the blue up there is standard Google TensorFlow stuff. There's they have a Toka, a TensorFlow Lite compiler and they have a TensorFlow Lite interpreter, which has a thing called a delegate function, which allows you to basically replace any step you know, with your own stuff, be it software or hardware. So we use that. The orange is um, our stuff. There's some graph level optimizations that you'd suspect, uh, because the hardware can do certain things together, et cetera, and the NKL, is the low-level neural kernel library, and that's where knowledge of the instruction set is. 
inside of there is hundreds of different convol <laughs> routines of convolution A.13, right? B.17 with different sizes, different things, all coded by hand by one of these really smart um, new UT students we have. And all that comes together with the user data and our, our code into a thing called a loadable. It is a thing, giant structure. And then there's the x86 runtime library. We actually uh, did a lot of optimization on x86. Since, since we do x86 processors, we're fairly fluent in optimizing x86 code or understanding its performance. So we did a lot of optimization doing things with ABX 512 that weren't publicly done in ABX 512, et cetera, to make our library. And we have a Linux device driver which knows about the interface and it's managing, allocating memory, allocating the processor. And ultimately then the driver's gonna load up both the in-core program and the x86 program and have at it, right? And those two are talking together, moving data back and forth, et cetera. So this is the chart that puts a lie to the fact that I never talk about software. <laughs> um, the proof of this is coming up, because I'm gonna talk about the MLPerf uh, benchmarks and their submission where we took uh, off the shelf, if you will, or off the benchmark shelf, uh, TensorFlow code and ran it several applications, and it worked. Because in that benchmark, as I'll mention, I think, you, you can't play with it. You've got to take it as it is and run it if you're in the closed category, which we are. So that's what I want to talk about now. So there's an, I assume you may or may not know this, there's a new benchmarking source of now. And when I was younger, I went to all the conferences and all the uh, places and talked about how horrible benchmarking was in our industry, and it is, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I've been pleasantly surprised with MLPerf. It's a new benchmarking consortium. Everyone participates in it. Uh, the, the, when I say everyone, the universities, all the startups, and all the, all the big players. And uh, They've got a closed category where you've got to take the code and the data as it is, not touch it, not change it, not optimize it, and run it. And you have to hit a certain level of, of um, uh, accuracy. You know, every day there's a new paper, someone comes out and says, well, I figured out how to do uh, image detection with a half a bit, right? Uh, you know. Uh, the problem with all that is, first of all, massive retraining, and secondly, accuracy, because you're quantizing away accuracy when you, you do those things. You have to hit an accuracy target. So running with this stuff as it is and meeting the accuracy are hard, and after you do all that, they audit. <laughs> they have an auditing function to make sure you're not cheating. So I think this is all great. Uh, what, uh, the first submissions were last October. I'll make a point, I'll come up later when I show numbers, that this was only a month after we got working silicon. This is a, a, a really great effort by, by the team. Uh, is, that, is that after you got the silicon or after you got the silicon working? After we got the silicon, after it arrived in the machine room. So you yes. Put it on silicon. Yeah, as you know, with I don't know if you know, I mean, nothing works when it gets back. There's a million, in a modern processor, there's millions of configuration things. The DRAM, the processor, the bad ones have to be weeded out, but you don't have a test program to weed them out, but they, then you do, but then the test program's bad. You know, I mean, you're a miracle if you have something running in a month, period in a month. So it was a, what's that? Bring up is typically a year. Well, and we're not done with bringing up, bring up but I'm just saying, yes, this was a, a a really forced march, and uh, I'm very pleased with it. Uh, there's a number of categories, 
and we submitted in the closed category. The other, only other chip people that did it were Intel, NVIDIA, Qualcomm, and Centaur. A lot of other people, AMD, ARM, et cetera, are missing. And the results came out, were published in uh, a month later. We're in the inference category. There's also a training category and training benchmarks. There are five benchmarks uh, done, and I listed up there for interest. Uh, the size of the weights and the number of Macs it took to process, you know, one unit, which is a sentence for NLP or an image uh, for image. And uh, you can see that in natural machine well, things get very, very big. They get big in both Macs, but also in the data. There was one, we submitted the four that are highlighted there. There was one other we just didn't get to. Um, it's fairly uh, straightforward. Now, I want to make a point that uh, these are popular names like ResNet. ResNet is the standard benchmark in the image world. Everyone quotes ResNet, and they're all different. We have a version of ResNet that we get 30% better performance on than the version that MLPerf has. You know, these are very, very specific things. So I'm saying the obvious. Uh, beware of vendor claims. <laughs> uh, it's easy to quote a ResNet score. This is a very specific ResNet. Uh, it is. Anyway, we submitted those four, and we were the only chip people to submit GNMT. Now, I'm, I'm going to show you in a second. Our numbers aren't fantastic, but we did because that's a, something that has massive data and it's a recurrent uh, neuron, so called RN. Image doesn't have any memory. I assume that's obvious to you. You just, uh, natural machines, natural language processing has to have memory. It's what you said before is matter now, the last word affects the next word, et cetera. And so there's been a lot of work on neuron structures that remember. In fact, we have some things that are designed specifically to help there. And as a result, it really takes maybe three or four neurons to do one neuron's worth of work in these recurrent things. So we did it, the GNMT, to show that we could do it. And as I said, it turned out we were the only one there. Now, there's a lot of really good numbers that were reported. There were configurations that cost tens of thousands of dollars. It's not us. I will compare to the thing that we, in a second, that I think we compare best closest to, but it wasn't a great, there weren't any things that were really exactly like us. And it goes without saying that today our numbers are better than what we submitted because we only had a month. But this is what I, I, my chart will compare to. There was a new part from Intel. It's not a high-end part, but it has, it has this new instruction set called VNNI from Intel designed for uh, inference. It's AVX512 thing. It's, as I said, a relatively low-end uh, thing. It does have a built-in GPU. The other thing is sort of interesting. It was a new device that came out literally. There wasn't it wasn't even easily available that when we did this. Uh, from NVIDIA, NVIDIA has a million GPUs. This is a device that has several ARM cores and is specifically aimed for, aimed at uh, plug it into your piece, to your box and you have a computer. It happens to be an ARM computer and it does have uh, a lot of hardware assist. Some other processors, there's a Qualcomm Snapdragon. We're not in the, you know, this, this is a high-end phone chip, but we included it because Snapdragon is their architecture, their SIMD architecture. We wanted to see how well it did. And then most people are using a part that you can't even really, ordinary people can't buy from Intel. Uh, the best one is that 9282, which is a dual, the things using that use two of them. Each of them has 56 cores. Each of them has 12 memory channels. You get the idea. And I actually compare with that because that's something interesting to, to see. And now down the bottom, the week before we submitted these numbers, 
Intel announced a new thing from, they had bought a company. Uh, Nirvana <laughs> announced a new device. It's a PCI device. It has equivalent of 12 of our cores. It has 12 lumps of 4,000 neurons, and then they use two cores. Interesting enough, they've now withdrawn this other than to their top customers because they have gone and bought a company called Habana, which has a better solution than Nirvana. But anyway, we compared with it. Um, this is latency. I won't, won't let you, uh, belabor it, except that you might suspect uh, regular processors like the Intel thing and the Qualcomm thing uh, don't have great latency. Either, even the massive thing there on the right doesn't have any better latency than us. So latency was one of the things that was measured by MLPerf, again, reemphasizing its importance. Okay, the yellow numbers are what we submitted, the green numbers are roughly what they are today. Our um, score on uh, SSD, which is object detection, was uh, abnormally low because we just didn't have time. It's gone up a lot, the others have gone up normally. Now, I mentioned to you GNMT is only 12 sentences a second. I mean, that's 12 is not a number you normally like to put on charts. <laughs> Uh, but given that no one else did it at all, we compare, we claim we're infinitely faster, yeah. I just went back, was the Intel Monster one, was that two? Of two, two of those 56, so it's 112 cores, totally 24, 24 memory channels, 140 meg of L3, I mean, you know, yeah, pretty impressive. But yet, if I may be snide, they can't do a decent neural coprocessor. They bought two companies now trying to get a solution. Uh, so you can see that the NVIDIA part, uh, and I put approximately $1,000. I don't know what it, what it really cost. You don't never know on these things, but that's a fair, we think. Cost for it is pretty good. Regular CPUs are pretty uh, poor. The Monster with uh, uh, 112 cores is a lot faster. But what I do on the next chart is normalize this, and I realize there's too, too many words here. I'll get to the punchline. If you look at the Intel stuff, which has the world's best core, it has two AVX 512s with NNNI, that's new instruction set. You know, most people are lucky to have one AVX 512, like us. They have two per core plus this new instruction set, and we run at a performance about equivalent to 24 of their cores. Interestingly enough, they have a 24-core part that lists for $3,600 that uh, has all the stuff that we should be roughly equivalent to. But anyway, we're just doing numerology here, but it's reasonable to divide their score with these really good cores divided by the number of cores. And we find out that, that uh, we're about equivalent to 24 of their cores, a really good cores. Uh, and down the bottom, I pointed out that we get almost a fourth the performance of this thing that has the equivalent of 12 of our cores on it. It has 12 times 4K neurons, and we're getting a fourth of that with 4K neurons. Uh, again, we're doing efficiency studies on, on all these things, and uh, we're quite pleased with our efficiency. This is uh, actually my last chart. What do we learn? Well, you'd expect me to be proud of our team, but I, I mean, Centaur has done things with a very small team forever, and we just did it again. A coprocessor approach is clearly a very good idea. We're getting very good performance in a very small area. Uh, so achieved all of our goals. Originally, we had to guess at what functions we wanted to do and what the architecture was, and our guesses are pretty good, so we feel pleased with that. However, in fairness, now that we've got running applications, 
there are things we see that could be done better. Uh, the ram is slightly overkill and there's maybe not optimally shaped. There are some additional instruction features or more likely NDU features that we've come across that need to be added. Remember, NDU is our data manipulation thing. Uh, different slice geometry might be better. And we're quite confident that if we were doing it again, we would get more performance in the same area. But still, our performance numbers are good, the size is small, and we did it from scratch. So obviously, we think it's a good effort. So I'm shocked that I got no in-depth questions. <laughs> There's one. <laughs> well, I know all the questions. I'm not going to give them to you. Yeah. Yes. Did you consider, um, instead of having a coprocessor, just making the vector width wider in the x86 cores, like say 4,000 bit vectors in the x86 cores, and then have some way to go directly from the L3 into the core and skip the, the L2 and L1 hashes and just make the, the L3s bigger? The question was, do we consider if you will, making a much wider AVX 512, a 70 unit in the cores. Uh, and you hinted at it in what you said there, it requires everything to change. The L3 has to be wider, the L2 has to be wider, the L1 has to be wider. These things have to be fed with data. I'm, I'm saying not just bypass the L2 and L1, go straight from the L3 into the vector. Well, it still has to be wider. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the Intel memory hierarchy is, a, is all built around 64 byte lines. A 64, that's why AVX 512 is 64 bytes or vice versa. It would tear up the cores and uh, we did consider it very long. Uh, there's enough special things. You'd not only have to do that, you'd have to add more of these, more units. You'd have to add new instructions. Uh, there's a lot of thing, a lot of this weird stuff you do that we do in these applications that aren't efficient to do in x86 instructions, so you have to do it. So you, basically, you're tearing up any semblance of a core, and um, the, the software to run that is a little bit har harder to do than what we did. We had the advantage of in a room, there was me at one end and the software guys at the other end, and so the software and the hardware matched, right? When you're fooling with an enhancing x86 architecture, there's a lot of other considerations you have to do. You just can't roll your, uh, your own that easily. So the real answer to the question, did we consider making wider AVX 512 for about one millisecond? Yeah. <laughs> Do you think anyone is going to buy the CPU just for the x86 side, or would they buy it only in the mini core? The question was, will anyone, well, it was from somebody, by the way, who claims to have a nano laptop, so we need to <laughs> find that, get the details there. Uh, the question was, is um, anyone going to buy it just for x86, or will they always want to use the neural? We don't know. As I said, we have silicon. It's been demonstrated. We're talking to customers as we speak, and uh, I think the jury's out on there. One reason why we took the approach that we did is we didn't burden the x86 cores very much with this, and so if a person who just wants a low-cost edge server, you know, with eight cores and 16 meg of memory, they got it. But if they want a decent, you know, if they want the neural assist, they got that too. So. Uh, our approach is always quite simple. We'll sell whatever to anybody who has <laughs> the wherewithal, right? But we don't know. Yeah. Uh, if you could do it again, if you could do it at, at three nanometers, or no, sorry, five nanometers. Yes. What changes would you make to the architecture? Well, if our highlighted there, we've already identified quite a few, and we could get a lot more. First of all, there's architecture changes, regardless of the size that I 
hint at there that make it more efficient, even at 4K wide. But we would get a lot more, uh, a lot more function per at a small area. It's a third. It's roughly a third. I'm not an expert on the technology. It's slower power. It's faster, and typically that just translates to more. Uh, but for us, five nanometers is a ways away, uh, and so we are looking at architectural things. The technology always comes. The technology you can always take advantage of by doing more. You know, more cores, more L3, etc. cetera. Uh, that will happen sort of automatically. Yeah, Dennis? You create processors. You know, I'm really delighted by what you build here. But it's just, you know, you're, you're adding a whole new set of capabilities to the combined processor. Do you think people are going to use this for things other than uh, machine learning? Adapt the processor for some other purpose? I don't know what it would be, yeah. but there's a lot of things there that could be done. Well, a question uh, is, uh, do we think people will want to use this for something other than the standard uh, deep learning applications we know of? Maybe. I mean, the part... It is what it is, uh, and we did put in a number of sort of extra things for flexibility, uh, but we really haven't focused on, on that. We had our hands full. Again, if you remember my first chart, the size of the team and how much we've got running and hardware and the applications we've done, we've been uh, focused on that. We did, along the way, talk, work with two other groups or talk to them uh, one was, as I mentioned, a uh, uh, security camera that wants to move into uh, deep learning. It's actually got a name. It's called Cubis. It's just a company, and they were good to work with. The other, which I won't mention the name, is a company that does car things like license plate detectors and things like that. You know, every car must have... <laughs> And uh, so that was interesting because we learned the requirements for car things. What comes of that, I don't know. Yes? Uh -oh. Mac, I'm not familiar with this area. Oh, it's just multiple, uh, the question is what's a Mac? Multiply, accumulate. <laughs> so that's the fundamental atom of life here. Probably the same thing. It's just the signal processing. Have you talked to the radar guys? No. Uh, we don't know any radar guys, but <laughs> that's that's one reason. The question was, have we talked to other people like radar guys? That's one reason I'm going around giving talks, right? We are a small company. Most people haven't heard of us, but we think we have something useful. Is it applicable? I don't know. It's doing a questionable uh, floating point, this new uh, B float 16, which I'm not sure everyone has fully contemplated. Uh, I'm trying to get at the radar guy as we speak right now. Okay. Uh, so just, just one comment. Yes. Uh, or two questions and a comment. I've never had a chip made for me yet that has enough Max in it. Yes. <laughs> I don't need more Max than anybody else listening to me. Okay, well. And, uh, my question is, is uh, Look like that's so incredibly efficiently packed. What percentage of that uh, layout was hand laid out versus auto routed? It was all auto routed, but it was auto routed. Uh, it was all auto routed. But the RTO was knew a lot about geometry and the way it was written. Now it's my RTO, and the build guy is very good applied. You know, these modern build tools have 2,000 parameters uh, to them. He knew the right 2,000, and we did a lot of experimentation. So no, it's not custom. It's the only thing that's custom in there are the arrays. The arrays are, the RAMs are custom, but the, uh, the slices are all built using Synopsys tools, but built with someone who really knows them and with with him and I, 
one thing I learned doing this versus other things I've done is how much the build should affect RTL and vice versa. You know, it so happens as a side comment that the build guy was the first Centaur employee 25 years ago, so <laughs> uh, we can work together. Yes. Why are you hiding the instruction set? The question is, why are we hiding the instruction set? Probably because we're going to change it. <laughs> uh, because the instruction set is reflecting the detailed functions in the neuron, and particularly in the uh, data unit, and uh, we want the freedom. You know, I've spent my whole life stuck with it. You know, before this, all the way back to IBM, when I was an IBM fellow, I was the IBM representative to Intel on architecture matters. So for 35 plus years, I've been stuck with an instruction set that, <laughs> where you can't change anything because one day in 1978, someone made it. So we're trying to avoid that. This was our first effort. Uh, you would, you know, we're smarter now. It's good. We're proud of it. That we think it will sell, but we can do uh, we can do a better one, and we want the freedom to do that. Uh, also, we don't. We talk to customers, and we haven't found. Well, I won't, there's one potential customer who's. In, who might be interested in doing some experimentation with it, et cetera. They're like, but in general, real customers don't care about this. They want to know, do you support PyTorch? And do you have these, this, yeah, that was this a function? Yeah, other applications that you haven't envisioned, which you'll probably have to know the instructions um, Well, I'll give you the usual answer. If someone has a good reason to know it, and wants to do some low-level stuff, and if they have the, the proper wherewithal, of course, we'll expose it to them. But as I said, we want, we want the freedom to make it what we want. This is only release one, and we think this is a, a law that has a life to it. Yes? Are there, yeah. Are there any export controls on the chip? Yes. Uh, this chip, This chip has the standard, has a design, it has a design license because we do export pieces of the design but does not include neural. The question was, are there export controls on it? Has a design license, a manufacturing license to TSMC and then a product license. The design license does not include our neural. We don't plan right now to export the neural. Uh, I'm not sure I should say so, but one of ordinary skill can read, read a bit and find out that we have exported our designs in the past to another country that shall remain nameless, but we don't, did not export this and don't have any plans to. Uh, yes? Yes, the question is, can this chip be used for training uh, as well as inference? Only in the sense of the x86 course training today requires a real floating point, 32-bit floating point. I don't believe they're training with that. But in any case, it's uh, so if, if that's right, then I miss. If you can train with a 16-bit uh, D float, then I'm mistaken. It's my impression, I'm not an expert in it, that it requires a floating point. But again, it requires uh, so much compute time to do training today. Uh, training on a 32 core part will take days to, or, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. It's just 4,000 neurons is not that much. But, so we, we haven't, as far as I know, we haven't considered it. But again, we're welcome to, to anybody who has the right stuff to play with it and try things. That's really a question I'll, I should have had our AI expert, Parviz, here on the phone. He could uh, answer that better than I can. 
Yes. Could you give me a really top level description of how you uh, test it to verify that it's all <coughs> The question is, uh, how do we test it? <laughs> uh, we tested it uh, the old-fashioned way. I actually tried. We have a very strong formal verification team there, and I did have some formal verification done on the instruction on the NPU, but it's after some point it went away. So we tested it the old-fashioned way. Unit test, tested a human sits down writing this 128-bit instructions tested everything that they thought needed to be tested. And then we uh, tested it using, as the software team developed the, the TensorFlow software, we tested it using not just real application, but made up things, variations, permutations. So it was tested the old-fashioned way, which is people writing tests and running them. I usually worry about data dependent problems. It's possible. The floating point, for example, got a lot of extra testing for the bad numbers. There's a lot of bad numbers in floating point. By bad, I mean not evil, but difficult numbers, right? Things that underflow, overflow, create NANDs, et cetera. So that got a, a fair amount of extra testing. but. Uh, I'm not, uh, all I can say to you is uh, we've made uh, no, no, um, we've had no problems in hardware. It doesn't mean there aren't any. It just means that what we've tested is what we're using right now. Again, one of the advantages, it's back to the question of why do I want to expose the instruction set? Well, one reason is, as I mentioned, I want to change it. The other is, uh, that leads to weird bugs. I mean, the, again, I spent 35 years dealing with the fact you have to run, not only you have to run this instruction set that's questionable in several features, you've got to run software that someone wrote in 1986. We, we test 42 different operating systems in the x86 part of us, right, by actual count. Uh, and some were People find weird things. I'll tell you an anecdote of off the point. Our first part, the Intel architecture has in the condition code a lot of don't cares. You know, and the first part we did, we said, well, they're don't care, so they're don't cares. And within seconds, the IBM mouse driver failed because it was using a don't care flag after a multiply, stuff like that. So we have spent a lot of... <laughs> The reason why, this is a side thing, some in our earlier thing today I had was on a conference call talking about the difficulties of doing x86, and someone asked, uh, someone implied that the reason there's only three companies that do it, Intel, AMD, and us, is because of patents. That's not true. It's because of tribal knowledge and the undocumented things and what you learn over, learned over 20 years of evolution. Um, so that... To help avoid that is another reason why I don't want you to write programs for it, <laughs> whoever you are. Yeah. Yes. I uh, have a lot of image processing, and the thing that often blows up uh, hardware for me is when I process two images, one that's all black or all white. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, you're bringing the question was not well, not really a question, observation of uh, strange images. There's a whole a lot of discussion of that, as you know, in the industry, because there's no real science behind this deep learning, right? You know, you pour things in a hopper, it's all experimental, and the answers seem to come out right, but you can't prove that tomorrow there's not an image that s says uh, something wrong. And uh, I won't get into that. Uh, <laughs>